Yeah, New York is actually where most of our people are. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanted to give this talk to emphasize the uh, narrative aspect of Jupiter and how that's amenable to data analysis. So I actually come from a neuroscience background and my thesis was on the reproducibility of science. I mean, it was, it was an EEG thesis and um, I just realized I didn't cue the video people. Are you all rolling already? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so I, my work was on reproducibility and I found this extraordinarily handy. And to give another shout out, when I first got started writing Python, uh, it was thanks to Anaconda that I was able to get in there and write code and not you know, fail at the terminal. Um, as, as wonderful as pip is, sometimes it's a little unwieldy and Anaconda's um, products make it easy for you to jump in right away. So uh, Python and data analysis are a bit unusual in that it's not just writing code, but um, the project of doing reproducible data analysis really requires um, tools that allow you to construct a narrative and to iterate often and to explore, and also to be able to share that coherently with other people. and. You know, commenting is great, but um, there are much more powerful tools available in the Jupyter. What used to be strictly IPython and now the relatively language agnostic Jupyter Notebook. Um, so you're just going to follow along with me. Live demos. This is going to go well, right? Uh, so you can read more of this later. I just wanted to be explicit about um, the importance of using open source data tools in here. Um, you've probably already been sold on this as Python people. Um, I've given this elsewhere, um, say in scientific communities, and it's a little bit newer. But you understand like uh, reproducibility is essential, and um, the Jupyter Notebook is especially amenable to sharing and uh, easy reading online. And then you know I'm making a case for the notebook per se, and I'll show you the tools that I think make it especially useful. So I actually don't think I would be here today without tab completion, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room, both on the command line and in uh, the Jupyter Notebook. That allows you to use, basically, if ever you're in doubt, use tab completion about anything, um, both because you can access methods and attributes this way, and you can see what you have available, and because you can explore the documents available to you with that command. Um, you can also check you know, the imports available to you, which I think is super handy. And also feel free to stop me at any point during the talk, um, especially if you're trying to follow along and something maybe isn't working as it's supposed to because this is a newer version of Jupyter and so on. And then built-in documentation. You see something really um, comprehensive here. Uh, this, is, this has saved me an enormous amount of time because normally I have to move to something else. but. Um, uh, as I just read in Jake Vanderplas's new book, which is a data science handbook for Python, and it's excellent. Um, it, it's, it tremendously saves on the workflow to have documentation built in like this, or for something more brief, just shift tab. Uh, I thought this was a really important GIF to include, but the real point here is that um, you can write Markdown in HTML, you can use magic methods, I didn't have to here, um, to, to include tech if you have to do uh, math, or like in my thesis I wanted to show, um, say, the formula I was using. And then syntax highlighting for other languages. Again, with the magic methods, um, or you can access documentation here, like something really comprehensive if you want to scroll through just to see what's available to you. Or you can, as I often do, just look at the names of things and see if that's what I think it'll be. And you can load other languages in, as long as you're okay with ignoring warnings. And run R code in here. I actually work on a team where other people are using R and even Julia, and I use Python, and we can, um, share code this way, or I can show them an analogous operation in Python if they are interested. Multimedia, shout out to Sarah. <laughs> uh, right now, uh, notebooks are directly viewable on GitHub. That's a fairly recent uh, phenomenon. It's not available on Enterprise, but 
um, for the rest of us it is. You can also export as PDF or HTML. For a long time, I was actually following Jake's blog where he rendered his notebooks as HTML and made you know, beautiful blog posts. Um, you could follow along in his code. And then shell commands. So as long as you precede a command by an exclamation point, you can access um, something like this, for example. Oh, I didn't realize that it highlights another directory. That's good. And then keyboard shortcuts. I've actually noticed a lot of people presenting from the notebook who interact with these buttons. And um, I can appreciate that. Like the point of the notebook is to be a graphical interface to IPython. Um, but it's much faster to, you take, to leverage the different modes. You have like editing mode where you're actually editing the code. And then um, a command mode where you can um, uh, I don't know how to say it, except kind of be meta about it, like move your cells around or add new cells or the like, and it's extremely fast. Um, has anyone here not used pandas yet? <laughs> right, awesome. Uh, <clears throat> of the people who haven't used pandas, have you used R? Awesome, yeah. Um, Wes had R in mind when he was developing Pandas. Um, and uh, the people on my team who started with R have actually converted three of them to Python um, pretty successfully because they didn't realize like how clearly um, R operations translate to Python. So again, with the documentation, um, the, the point with the Jupyter Notebook is that you can check in with documentation um, at every step of the way. So I'm actually uh, pretty devout about checking in with info like this, getting information on the data types and how many entries I have for a given field, or describe. Um, this is a little incoherent because this is a government data set and uh, we all know how clean those can be. <clears throat> this is actually uh, income data for the entire United States from the IRS for 2012. Uh, there's a lot of information there, but um, I've already done the exploration part. I'm not going to walk you through deciding what variables to include, but um, there they are. These fields are interesting because you not only get the state information and the income information, but the, the structure of the data as they wanted to do it was to provide for every given zip code six tiers of income. And then within those tiers, the, the total AGI reported within that tier, um, also reported in the thousands, which is kind of bizarre. So the way you might see this is Uh, that these are five of the six uh, income tiers for a given zip code. The number of people within those tiers in that zip code, um, which is interesting because I, I would love to see like a frequency distribution like of, of the, um, the income tiers within a zip code. And then the total amount of money returned. So I guess I should also explain, I, I already, I've been practicing this talk and somebody said, you should probably explain what a data frame is. So. Um, <laughs> Just like in R, you know, a data frame is this, this object in pandas that provides you um, its own index, or you can set your, your own ind indices. And then um, it, it's just like a tabular format for the data. And uh, because pandas uses NumPy, you have access to a lot of uh, really fast operations on data frames, like much faster than having to write loops. Hi. Well, I have to oh, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, I forgot about that part. <clears throat> uh, I actually should have talked more about this because I think this is one of the most amazing aspects of pandas. Um, a huge pain point with data analysis at all is loading in your data. Um, and pandas allows you to import uh, many styles. I actually, in my daily life, just read SQL right into pandas and um, can operate on it from there. 
uh, read CSV has you know all of these available keywords and you know really comprehensive documentation um, which I like to use maybe not here because I'd like to step through things more explicitly and kind of drawn out but you can front load a lot of your work transforming data and making it amenable to analysis by just um, customizing your read CSV um, so that's what I did. I, I read it in and assigned it to the AGI variable. Uh, it's also important, uh, I should also have made clear that um, this environment is like one big REPL. So whatever I do, whenever I read in data, I assign it to a variable and then I leave it there um, as like a canonical copy of that data so I can revisit it easily. So any operation that I'm doing um, uh, on this data, I assigned to a new variable not not every operation has a new variable but subsequently I have like AGI subset very explicitly named um, so I can remember that's what I'm operating on uh, the default is typically to when you perform an operation on a data frame be returned a view of that data rather than uh, uh, operate on it in place anyway I think because that's a conservative bet with data analysis but you can explicitly describe in place equals true for that. When you, I, I actually, I'm curious about what y'all think about this. Um, when you slice on rows in pandas, it's actually totally inclusive as opposed to other arrays. And I actually think that's, um, useful, but I can see how it's controversial because it's idiosyncratic. I don't know. Uh, maybe we can all have an Editor Wars-like argument about it afterward. And so this is a demonstration of that subset. Note that, like, by, like I said, it's a, because it's inclusive, the exact rows you name are the rows returned. You can also easily rename um, your columns. So that there's something a little more, you know, co um, coherent than N1 and A00100. Um, one thing that you can do, so pandas is interesting because it's not just um, analogous to other operations you might do in R, but also in SQL. Um, so sometimes, for efficiency's sake, I do all of my group by in SQL before I pull data down. But you can also do these operations in pandas. Um, so I just grouped by zip code because I wanted to collapse all income tiers and the information therein into the zip code overall because that's a more logical way to share that information with other people than separated by tiers. And so we were cruising along and then um, I decided to include this cat picture because I love cats more than anything ever. And uh, uh, something I wanted to point out here is that we have like an unusual value here. Um, it turns out quintuple zero is not actually a zip code and uh, we need to remove that from our data. And this is where something like a reproducible notebook is super important. Um, I don't know whether you're working with data or whether you're working with code. Um, it's very easy to um, perform some kind of operation and then forget what you did even a day later and when you're trying to express something, express that to somebody else it's incoherent. So. Um, Whatever ap approach you decide, whether it's just to delete data outright or just call it null, um, it's explicitly stated here um, for the next person to come along. So, the, you know, so for example, like the overall population mean for this data right now is listed as 10,000. Um, uh, but when I drop that unusual set, <clears throat> first by calling it a NAN, reassigning it NAN, and then removing it, NAN is like a special... Um, explicit value in pandas telling you that what you have isn't valid. So just by noting that we had this unusual value, which you can check in with um, through exploratory data analysis by, you know, say using like frequency distribution or exploratory visualization, um, you can decide to drop that and then you find that the population mean is half what it was because of that, like, um, meaningless value, that, that catch-all quintuple zero. And then we move on, and um, the way that you can access values in a given field is 
you know, by dot notation, or I like to use these labels, and um, I just spontaneously, not spontaneously, but I like, like to generate for myself a new column assigned the value of this amount multiplied by 1,000, because after digging through a very long document, I found that that's how they were reporting it. Um, something else to keep in mind that's really um, excellent about pandas and um, the methods afforded you is that sometimes you can use a loop or something like apply, or you can use um, vectorized operations. And I want to show you the difference between their performance here. So apply is super useful because you know you can just bring in any function you want to and apply it to uh, an entire field. But um, you know doing what what looks like just a simple mathematical operation directly on the value is significantly faster. It's about 250 times faster to just um, perform that operation than to use and apply for it. I mean, sometimes apply is all you have, but does that make sense so far? An apply map. Um, I got to admit, I've, I don't use anything called apply map. I believe from my reading, apply, apply is apply map. But somebody else could correct me. Yeah. Okay. So this is our this is the shape of our data at this point. You can either return the entire set, although it's you know it's um, it is truncated, or as I often do, call the head, check it out, and then call the tail, um, and return just like a, a small subset of rows to check in on those values. Um, 999 is actually also garbage, but valid. I don't remember why. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, then I just repeat these operations and assign them to new, uh, new values willy-nilly, and I still get what I want. Then I um, drop. I dropped these extra fields because they aren't actually interesting for my analysis. They were just a means to an end. That's what I had to uh, perform those operations on. And then uh, merging again, which is another really powerful tool in pandas, which allows me um, to join this table to the information from the original table again. Um, when you perform a group by operation, um, it's, you know, it would be incoherent to aggregate strings. So th that information is dropped from the um, the table returned to you. And because I'd like to join the state on zip code again so we can aggregate by that information, I just um, drop the duplicates from this so I have that table by itself and then make a new table um, merging these. Merging is like a join except it's not using indices. I can decide what I want to merge on and, and also um, uh, You can start or end this um, inquiry with a question mark. Um, also has a lot of options. So we find um, when I sort this final data set um, by a descending order, um, Oh, yeah. Um, so I used left join or left merge, um, but you have you can use an inner or outer if you want. Um, yeah, I just connected them on the zip code. Yeah, and, and Python's smart about that, so um, it could repeat as necessary. Like, whatever, whatever I prioritize in here being left, being the data um, about income. I can choose that. This is interesting. I feel like the last time I did this, DC was the greatest weighted mean AGI. Oh, that's right. Um, this zip code, which is um, because we get to see the population amount 
really unusual. It's 250 people in the zip code are making um, 2 million each on average. I'm sure, the, I'm sure the distribution would be super wonky, but um, I want to move there. Um, then we can group by state. Uh, yes, so DC um, has the is the state, um, but again, that's unusual because that's much smaller than other states, and we all know DC is special anyway. Um, has the highest weighted mean AGI, and the rest of these values may not surprise you. I don't know anything about New Jersey being from the West Coast, but um, they're rolling in it too. And um, Another thing that I really appreciate about pandas is that there is just um, there's a plotting method in in pandas. You can leverage something more powerful, but a little less wieldy in Matplotlib. Um, but just for you know really fast exploration, you can just try a plot, basically like append a plot to your data frame, and you might get something coherent back. But um, you can also you have a huge array of keywords you can use to shape this. And then these are my references. These are places you can visit to have like a more comprehensive treatment. Hi. Uh, what would happen if you had a plot? I haven't tried running the plot inside. Um, just IPython in the terminal. Outside of the notebook? Um, if I had to guess, I would, yeah, I'm not actually going to guess. Maybe I'll try to do it right now. Uh, I don't actually know how to leave this view. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Any other questions? <laughs> Just link to it directly? I'm not aware of that. That might be cool, but well, uh, can I ask what the motivation is for explicitly linking to that part of the notebook? Is it just for understanding like the provenance or yeah. Oh, interesting. That's an interesting problem. Um, I'm not aware of something like that in IPython. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have repeated the question. The question was whether there, whether it's possible in IPython notebook to pull, say, a particular function from somebody else's notebook um, linked such that when it's updated, your code's updated. That's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Typically, if I'm using something of somebody else's, um, like, huh, depending on how specific the function seems or how elaborate, I'll still include it and then cite it. Right, that is a good point. Um, to live update? Yeah.
Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at this point they're the same. Um, IPython has been kind of um, subsumed under Jupyter, um, IPython notebook was developed explicitly for Python, um, but the Jupyter project has since taken it over and you know, still implements like the IPython notebook, but um, it's, it's pretty language agnostic now. So there, there is the equivalent notebook for R, Julia, and I think Ruby and other languages. Uh, I'm not aware of that development. I know that you can still import those um, other languages' code, albeit um, in a way that looks pretty clunky into these notebooks. Um, but yeah, that's actually a problem I'm trying to work on um, with my employer, again, because I work with people who use other analysis languages. Oh, yes. The Python Data Science Handbook is really new, it's actually, you know, uh, still missing references and um, this is the first iteration, but it's excellent. I, I use Python, so the question was um, if I, you know, in this case, it was a government CSV, so it's amenable to representation as a data frame, but when I find data that is not, um, I'm usually encountering that uh, in SQL, um, or, you know, sometimes I'm sent, like, Excel files or things like that, uh, and I still use Python for all of it. Um, the the Keywords afforded you by reading Excel files um, are also really comprehensive. And um, I guess in the case of SQL, I often have to walk JSON blobs, but like Postgres gives you that, um, that possibility. Yeah, I can, I can do anything in Python, basically. Because you, oh, I, I, should, I didn't show you, but there are you know, fantastic melting and stacking and unstacking functions available to you. Um, I just use read, read SQL, Pandas built in read SQL, and it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I typically have to use Psycho PG2. I'm not sure what other people might have to use. Did anybody follow along? Anybody? Sorry. Yes, I have, uh, I'm super interested in that question, um, in part because one of my goals at this point is um, like optimizing my queries such that you know, they're not as, as taxing. We have a pretty large data team at this point. And because um, I went to a talk, um, there's actually a Haskell shop in Portland of all places um, called Galois that um, gave us a security, like a database security talk. Um, the crux of which was it's important to design your interactions with um, databases to be as anonymized as possible. And given that I work for a bank, um, I, we, we have a saying called stay frosty. So I try to do whatever I can to avoid seeing individual um, elements when I'm pulling them down. Um, if I've if I've already had a chance to to vet them, so um, 
more of my aggregating work happens in um, Postgres, in part because we're just about getting big enough to go into big data, but I can still squeak by like writing efficiently um, to pull things into memory. So most of, most of my grouping is there, but anything else I'm actually doing in Python. I was hoping to be a little more hands-on about it. I kind of um, got to admit, I went into a blind terror when I started and may have skimmed over some, um, some information that should be made explicit here. Does anybody have any questions about like the magic methods I showed you or things that Pandas does? Like this time it magic is awesome. One of my favorite things. It is, it is slower. Apply is implemented in Python, and this, this vectorized operation is happening in the C layer. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's actually orders of magnitude difference, right, or, or an order of magnitude um, difference. Yeah. Uh, the question was, um, why is this operation much faster than this operation, and I tried to include it in the comment. It's happening at the C level. Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, I've actually worked with a lot of people um, who prefer Excel. Um, maybe if I, announce, if I say it here, somebody else will beat me to it, and that's a good thing. I actually want to start a series of posts showing people that everything you can do in Excel, you can do in Python, and you don't actually have to remember your workflow. That's the thing I, I've worked with. Um, I've worked with people at my company and neuroscientists, you know, people who can uh, work with the hardware of an EEG headset and are afraid to write Python. Like, you can do this, I promise, um, especially because for every one of them, it's hard to remember the steps you went through. Uh, the neuroscientist whose work I tried to reproduce said that he just deleted his code. Um, so it was impossible to reproduce part of his work. I had to write it from scratch. Uh, so yes, I do have tips. Um, uh, one is to show people exactly what's analogous about this. Like I've had people ask me many times, like, I, I love pivot tables. Can I? What do I do with Python? It's like, well, there's pivot in Python, like um, our, our analysis workflows are shared despite using different tools. Um, so that's what I wanted to, this is my passion with the IPython notebook is um, there, you're afforded so many different means of expression that it's possible to document in a way that you think will work for the other person um, how this thing is working. You can be really um, low level with it. I, you know, I often include um, you know, screenshots from um, other people's blogs and the like, and just like make clear um, what's happening here. I don't know of it yet. That's why I'm thinking of it. Although, you know, a thought that seems like such a need, it probably already does exist, and I just need to go look for it again. The last time I checked, it didn't. Um, yeah. Yeah, the problem is that, you know, when you're afforded some, when, when you have some, a graphical interface like Excel, um, you have an inverse problem. Like, there are, you know, 10 different ways that you could perform an operation to get that result. And so trying to tell people trying to map those to a particular Python implementation might be difficult. Um, but I try to just tell people, like, show people the most succinct way and then say, like, under the hood, like, Python allows you to express under the hood, like, what decisions are being made to give them that output. Like, how does this merge work or how does this stacking work? Any more questions?
Yeah, so um, I, I worked on a machine learning project a little while ago um, using natural language processing. And yeah, yeah, the data lived in SQL. It's just like huge blobs of text that I was performing these operations on. And Python could manage it, but I noticed, um, I don't know about making, you know, apply itself faster, but this is a really good lesson in writing efficient functions. So um, using timing, uh, using time it on an ind individual function, um, there's time it for line based and then there's a, another version of time it for a chunk of code. And so I try to optimize an individual function as well as I can and then use the apply for it. Like rather than like the field? So rather than modifying this, the um, field in place in the data frame, you I haven't tried that. Yeah. Interesting. I kind of want to know more about what you're doing. But <laughs> Are we all set? All right. Thanks, everyone.